Um, okay, so this week we're going to be talking about sprinkler monitoring. I'm not going to go into so much detail as the dedicated sprinkler monitoring systems like we install in strip centers. This is going to be more over sprinkler equipment and how we interface it to the fire alarm. So this will apply to those dedicated function sprinkler system panels that are in our small lease space jobs that we get. Uh, but it'll also apply to much larger jobs like schools, warehouses, uh, high rises and everything in between. Um, so first I'm going to talk about how the sprinkler head itself actually works. You've got a few parts here um, starting just from top to bottom of this diagram. We have the plug that's actually plugging the hole where the water comes out. And the only thing holding it in place is that glass tube below it. And that red liquid that's in it is that uh, red mercury like you get in the, the thermometers. And what happens as it reaches its calibrated temperature, which is typically somewhere between 135 degrees Fahrenheit and 165 degrees. Um, once it reaches that temperature, the pressure in, from that red mercury expanding is going to be so high that it actually breaks that glass tube, which lets the plug down. And then when the plug comes out of the way, the pipe will already have water pressure and the water will come down, hit that deflector plate. And that's what gives it its spray pattern is that deflector plate. Um, this is why we talk about being really careful around these sprinkler heads, not hanging things on them. We're not using them to test for our ground faults and things because that glass tube is actually designed to break. That is the point of it is to break in case of a fire and dump all the water on you. Um, also, just a quick note, this is one of the areas where Hollywood is super wrong. People pull a pull station in movies and TV shows and get water dumped all over them. Obviously not because the pull station that we install has nothing to do with the sprinkler head that the sprinkler contractor installs. Um, there we go. Got my little 30 second soapbox out of the way. Uh, a few other things to look at here. Um, the picture on the right that's kind of blown up, I'm going to talk about that one first because you can see it a little easier. That's what a that's what we refer to as a tamper valve, sometimes called an OS and Y valve, uh, sprinkler shutoff valve. What this valve in this case on this riser should always be open, allowing water to flow. And anytime it's closed, that little red box that sits on top of that with that silver bracket is a switch we tie into that'll tell us the position of the valve has changed to that closed position, now restricting or completely stopping the water flow. So our fire alarm panel needs to let the building owner know, hey, your valve's not open like it's supposed to be. Um, you can also see that there is some flexible conduit coming down to it. And as you look down, this is a very large sprinkler system, probably for something like a warehouse where they're going to have a whole bunch of different sprinkler zones. So you can see each one has a, a conduit whip coming down to it. And looking over at the picture on the left hand side, it's a little blurrier. But down at the bottom of each sprinkler, there's a smaller valve with a 1900 box over it and then a conduit whip going up to where you can see the monitor module mounted on the wall with another conduit whip going up to another red box higher up. That's the water flow switch. Um, in a few more slides, I'm, I have some diagrams and pictures where we'll actually look at both of these things in a little more detail. Uh, but first, I want to just kind of cover what everything is, what it's doing. Both of these cases are larger sprinkler systems for a little bit larger buildings. Um, I was talking about those dedicated function sprinkler systems. Typically, what we're going to find in those, because the building is so small, it's just a handful of little lease spaces like maybe a coffee shop or uh, a hair salon or things like that. Um, you might just have the one riser and that one riser will actually be able to supply enough water to that whole building. And what you'll see is kind of a minimum on each riser is you'll have at least one valve and one water flow. And then sometimes there'll be a second valve oftentimes accessible from the outside of the building. We call that one a post indicator valve. And I'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, and then moving on to something we see in a little bit more complicated systems. This is a fire pump and I'm sorry that the pictures are terrible. Blame Google, not me. Um, so again, I'm going to start with the picture on the right. I don't know why I'm reading from right to left today, but I am. The picture on the right, there's a big red box that has a handle on it. And then to the left of it, there's a motor. So what's going on here, that 
red box on the right is your fire pump controller. And the thing on the left is a fire pump. These are used in cases where the sprinkler system is large enough that the regular city water supply won't supply enough pressure to actually fill the entire system and get water to the uh, to any sprinkler head fast enough to actually extinguish any kind of fire or to help prevent the spread of any kind of fire. So these fire pumps are used a lot in large warehouses where the pipes have to go long distance. Um, also used in high rises where they have to pump water up a building since they're having to pump against gravity. Um, anytime that they have to go up like that, they pretty much need a fire pump. So long distances and covering large areas because the pipes will get so big, they need some extra push to get the water to flow fast enough through the pipes. That's when they'll use fire pumps like this. A few other things you'll see when you see these fire pump systems, there's a smaller pump called a jockey pump. And the purpose of that is just to keep the sprinkler pipe all the way up to full pressure so that if a head does pop, then there's already enough pressure, the fire pump will kick on and then it'll really ram the pressure through. But the jockey pump is just to kind of maintain that pressure all the times that there's not a fire. So hopefully all the time, because you know we don't really hope for a fire on any of our customers that we admit. Um, Something else you'll see whenever you get in these rooms with these fire pumps, often there are pipes going every which different direction, valves all over the place, and the naming and numbering of them can get really confusing. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't know what most of them do. I'm not a sprinkler guy. I am I just do fire alarm. Uh, we'd have to, and a lot of sprinkler guys that I've talked to on job sites, even they're not sure what each one's for. They just have plans that say, I have to put all these in, so they do. Um, so we'd have to get a sprinkler system designer in here and give him a specific system to talk about so he could really explain what was going on. But aside from the jockey pump and the main fire pump, which will have both of which will have a cutoff valve on both sides of the pump. So there'll be a jockey pump inlet that, we're, that we can cut the water off and a jockey pump out that we can cut the water off. And that'll allow service work to go on at the jockey pump. And then for the main fire pump, there's going to be a fire pump in and a fire pump out that'll also have a valve so that they can cut those off and service the main fire pump. Um, then they also have other pipes. And I haven't figured out the rhyme or reason. Sometimes there's only one bypass or two or three or 27. I don't really understand. But they have pipes in place that'll go from, say, a giant water tank to... Um, to the main sprinkler system without actually going through the fire pump. So if something's happened with the fire pump and now the pump is restricting flow, that bypass, I think, allows water to get through. Even though it's not the full pressure, I think it's like a safety redundancy. Again, I'm not a sprinkler con sprinkler contractor, sprinkler designer, so I'm not exactly sure. Um, as far as the naming goes for every job, we just need to, to get in contact with whoever the sprinkler guy is out there on the job and uh, just coordinate with him what tags he's going to hang on which valve, because every valve is going to have tags. Every valve has to have a label. The fire marshal is going to make sure of that, and they won't pass a fire marshal inspection without that. So just ask him what his labels are going to be, and then we can make sure that our fire alarm panel reads the same label. Um, that'll help us pass the fire marshal the first time through. It'll also help for service stuff if one has to get turned off or there's a, you know, trouble at one of the valves or something weird happened. It having all the labels match everywhere will really make everything just better. Um, so that's kind of the overview of what's going on with sprinkler systems. There's there's valves, there's water flows. If there's any kind of switch on a fire sprinkler system, we have to tie into it. We don't really have an option. Um, every single point. The way we typically do it is uh, every individual valve, every individual water flow all get their own individual monitor module so they can all report in with their own specific uh, address and description at the panel. Um, by code, we're actually allowed to put more than one of each on a system. Fire marshals don't really like that even though it is technically up to code and uh, for service purposes and everything else it's just we're going to stick with our standard of putting 
one monitor to one switch. Um, now there is one tool that you'll need to work on sprinkler systems. Um, so a lot of times the, the water flow valves or the tamper valves or whatever it is will come with a little Allen wrench. And if you look on this bit load chart here, you can see there's a few different sizes of Allen wrench that have that hole in the middle. Regular Allen wrenches won't work for sprinkler equipment if you haven't already experienced that. I'll just let you know now. They have a little peg in there keeping a regular Allen wrench from getting in there. You have to have one of these security screwdriver sets or a security bit or even just an Allen wrench. But the problem with the Allen wrenches is it's only one size. And depending on which brand of sprinkler equipment they installed on that job, you might need different sizes. So then you're keeping up with multiple Allen wrenches. Whereas you can get one of these screwdrivers that are the multi-bit screwdrivers. And as long as you keep up with all your bits, no matter which brand or which product you walk up to, you're gonna have the right size for it. Um, so on the right hand side, that's a Klein screwdriver that's available at Home Depot, Amazon, wherever you want. Um, on the left hand side, I forget what the name of that is. It's something like Mega Pro or something like that. You can get that at a lot of electrical supply houses. It's an, these are two of the most common ones. They're not the only ones out there. Um, but I like this style the most where that back slides open and you can store the bits inside. I've had other kinds that had carrying cases for all the bits and then a separate screwdriver that you just put whatever bit you need in it. I always end up losing stuff in those. These are easier to keep up with to me. Um, but all the, all the different sprinkler valves, water flow valves, everything, they're going to have these security bits on them. So you're going to need something to be able to access it. And I forget which one, but one of the brands, sometimes you can get lucky and your regular little trim flathead screwdriver, like your panel screwdriver can fit in there. But if the sprinkler guy actually tightened it, you're not gonna make much progress with that. Granted, most sprinkler guys don't care, so they're not gonna tighten it all the way. But one of these, you don't have to worry about that. Um, okay, this right here is a PIV valve, post indicator valve. We have to get access to this by having the electricians run some underground conduit for us, or if we're unfortunate enough to have the conduit on that job, then that means we have to do the underground to get over to it. Um, they also have another type of PIV valve that is a wall-mounted PIV. It's the exact same thing, but it's coming horizontally out of the wall instead of vertically out of the ground. They work the exact same way. Um, now that picture in the center, so this time I'm reading from left to right for you guys. This time in the center, um, you can see there's there's two different ways these can be mounted, just depending on what style PIV they have, either before that open label or after that open label. They work. It works the same way no matter which way it's mounted, but those are the ways it can go. And then that last picture is actually a really good kind of exploded view of what's going on. Um, so the top, you just have the cover that's pulled off and you can see in there, there's a spring next to kind of an arm. And then there's some um, some screw terminals on the backside that we can't actually see the screw heads, but that's what's going on on that backside. And uh, you have this actuating lever coming out of the bottom and that's actually pushing against just part of the metal valve that as it moves forward and backward, it moves that lever forward and backward. And that'll actually tell us, that's how we know the position of if the valve is opened or closed. Um, this is one of the parts where it's really important to put your meter on it and make sure it's working before the fire marshal shows up. Because some sprinkler guys are really good and they get that thing perfectly set and it's wonderful and you don't have to worry about it. And you go out there and you test it with your meter and you've turned it like one turn and it's already telling you, oh, it's starting to close. And then you just open it back up and it's just fine. Um, there's other guys though, you have to like close it all the way before it tells you anything, if it even tells you anything, because they didn't bother checking the actual settings. They just installed it. They didn't adjust it at all. Um, and if you wait till the fire marshal shows up, he's going to fail you real quick for that because they want it to happen within the first two turns. They want that signal within the first two turns. Um, So if it's, you know, if it's two and a half turns, you're probably going to get failed for it unless you have like a real sly sprinkler guy that's able to get that half a turn out of it without the fire marshal looking. But we don't want to rely on that kind of stuff. We want to actually have it set right. So put your, you'll put your meter across the uh, 
the common and normally open terminals and, uh, and you know, make it the two turns. If, if it doesn't switch, you need to talk to the sprinkler guy. Hey, that valve's not adjusted right, or maybe it's broken or something, and get out there with him, and the two of y'all coordinate together and, uh, and get that set up. And I got a few more pictures here, just a few more views of this. So all the way on the left, I'll read from left to right again, because this is America. I do need to learn how to read. Um, you can see it set up. So it's same cover, same type of switch. You can see that actuating lever coming down. And now you can see that handle that has a, a metal bracket. So that as that metal bracket twists inwards, as he spins that wheel, it's going to follow the threads and push that bracket inward. It's going to push on that actuating lever, causing it to, to move the switch inside there. And then as you turn it the other way and you open it up, it's going to pull that actuating lever back the other way. And so that's what you're getting adjusted is where that bracket is mounted inside that inside of there so that it works exactly how it needs to work with that uh, with that switch. Now here in the middle, this is kind of zoomed in of the actual screw terminals. Each one of these tamper valves actually comes with two sets of switches. So you have switch one and switch two and they don't connect to each other at all. They don't have any connection. So if for some reason something is already on one of the switches, which on tamper valves, I've never really ran across that, but it could happen. Um, then you don't use those switches, you use the other switch if something's on it. They don't really show it very good in this picture, by the way, I got all these pictures off of System Sensors website. I just I, everything I got, I got from System Center. They're one of the big suppliers of it. Potter's another big supplier, and there's other brands. But they all work the same, regardless of what brand it is. This diagram doesn't actually show which one is A, normally open or normally closed, and B, normally open, normally closed. I, I went and looked that up. B is normally open, and then you have common. So nor what we will do is we'll put our resistor from B to common, and we'll take one leg from our monitor module, land it on common, take the other leg from the monitor module, land it on B. And that should be the right wiring. Um, then over here on the right hand side, it's a little bit better view of uh, where there's that spring. And what's happening is that spring is pulling on that actuating lever so that as, as your valve gets turned back out or goes back to its normally open condition for the, the water flow valve, then uh, then that spring is going to pull that lever back to set it back where it's supposed to be. Um, and then you can kind of see that shape where all those screw terminals are. And that's, that's everything that's inside of that cover. Um, there's not enough room out at these devices if you haven't messed with it yet, just so you know. There's not enough room to actually put the monitor module inside of the Inside of this box itself, we typically just pull a wire out here and put the resistor out here. The monitor module will go back in a junction box that's either mounted to the side of this or mounted to a wall, or if this is on a post indicator valve, it'll be inside the building and we're just running a wire out to the PIV valve. Um, and then to get into water flows, it's for the most part, water flows is a lot of the same thing, except for what it's actually doing. The tamper valves we've been talking about cause a supervisory signal because you're just letting the building owner know, hey, your valve's not open like it's supposed to be. It's closed and that's going to stop water. Um, the water flow valve causes an alarm because this is saying, hey, there's water flowing. That means one of your sprinkler heads is busted. If everything's going correct in a perfect world, it being busted means there's a fire. So we're going to report a fire alarm. Um, so looking from left to right again, you can see kind of this exploded view, how the U-bolt holds it onto that pipe, the paddle is supposed to go in the pipe, and you have uh, all your stuff on your switch. That's going to be where you, you wire it up and set the timing and everything. And then next picture over, you can see it uninstalled, but all assembled together. So you can kind of see how that paddle looks. We don't normally get to see that a lot because by the time we see it, it's fully installed. Um, this dimension picture I have, I have it in here so you can see how that paddle fills up that, that pipe because what happens as water flows, it's going to, to push that pipe or push that paddle up in the pipe, triggering a switch that we're watching the switch. 
And uh, then there's a spring inside there, real similar to how there was a spring on the tamper to return it to normal position. So that when the water stops flowing, that spring will be strong enough to bring the paddle down, but the spring is weak enough that the flow of water will move the paddle. So it, it's kind of a, they use the, I guess, just the right size spring or whatever. And then that last picture is just a picture of it installed. You can see the, how the flex has to go into it in the back. Um, these are pretty much always so close to the sprinkler pipe that flex needs to end with a 90 degree connector like that. And, uh, and that's just it all installed right there so you can see how you're not able to see that paddle because it's sucked up against that pipe. Uh, those paddles are also typically made of a flexible material so that they can fold them up or roll them up or something so that they can get them into the pipe because obviously they can't cut a hole the size of the pipe. Um, and then the last slide I have is talking more specifically about the control side of that. This is the side of the water flow that we have a lot to do with. So the, the first part over here on the left-hand side, this is the timing wheel. Every water flow has one of these on the bottom of it. Um, on this one in particular, you see it has all the seconds notated around it. it. It adjusts all the way up to 90 seconds. It has 15, 30, 50, 60, and then that last little bit of adjustment between 60 and 90. Um, fire marshals want to see between 30 and 90 seconds. They're really happy whenever we keep it more like 45 to 60 seconds. Ramsey's drawing something. I'll, I'll have to come back and look at what that is. Who just what? Oh, who adjusts the the time? Let me answer that. Okay. Guys, this is my I thought everybody's doing well. I'm gonna answer that question. Uh just so you hear it from the boss's mouth. <laughs> It costs us more time and more headache to get in a fight with a sprinkler guy going back and forth on who's going to turn the stupid dial on the little wheel. What I've, I've been doing this a long time, and what I inevitably do myself is I set those doggone things myself, and I test the timing myself. Uh, like Keith just said, uh, I usually always set them for 30 these days. I think you get your, they want them closer to 45. Mm -hmm. Set the time yourself. If it's not already set, test it yourself with your meter. I don't know. You're going to talk about that in a minute. How to test them? Yeah, yeah. I'll uh, talk about that. Okay, go, go, go ahead and test them yourself, and 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 get these things tested and adjusted ourselves. That saves us time. Uh, it, 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 you're already standing there. You might as well do it uh, and get it done, and not get in a argument with a sprinkler guy and a general contractor over who has to turn the valve. So uh, uh, test them ourselves. That, that's going to actually benefit us. Uh, back to Keith now. Yeah, and to add to that, um, adjusting it ourselves also helps everyone look better in front of the fire marshal. And when you make the whole job site look better, our customer appreciates that, uh, the fire marshal appreciates that, and the whole inspection goes a lot easier too. Because now you don't have a fire marshal who thinks, man, these guys don't know what they're doing. I got to look for everything. You got a fire marshal that's like, man, this is going easy. This is great. Easy day. I love that. And so having the fire marshal in that mentality, even if it takes, you know, a few more seconds out of our time, it's going to save us a lot on the end of the job as far as saving face in front of the fire marshal and the customer. Because the fire marshal and the customer, they don't care at all who has to adjust the stupid wheel. They just want it adjusted. Um, now, the the switch on the right-hand side, there's two sides of it, just like we talked about with the, with the sprinkler valve. And the two sides of the switch have nothing to do with each other. So you've got switch one and switch two that in no way at all connect to each other. And just like before, we have a common, an A, and a B. In this case, they put the normally closed and the normally open with the A and the B. And I'm going to talk first about the switch on the left-hand side, then I'll talk about what the switch on the right-hand side is doing. The switch on the left-hand side is our monitor module. This is watching it for that water flow alarm. And so you can see where they've got that end-of-line resistor going from common to normally open. 
and you can see they've got the negative line landed over onto the B terminal, which is normally open, and they've got the positive coming down landing on the common. Um, as far as checking it with your meter, you'll pull all of that off of there. You don't need to see the resistor. You don't need to see all that wire. So you can do this before you even wire it up. Uh, you'll put one meter lead on common, one on normally open. It should show an open condition. That's uh, most meters indicate that like an OL open line or overload circuit. It's uh, that'll say that. And then you'll pull down on the, uh, the, the little paddle switch that comes through. I don't have a picture of that. I didn't think about that until right now. Sorry. Should have had a picture of where that paddle comes through on this side. Um, but you'll pull on that. And as soon as you pull down, you need to have a timer going so that you can see exactly how many seconds it's taking. And, uh, and then you'll see when it goes into alarm and have that in that 45 to 60 second range. Anywhere in there, you're just fine. And, uh, and that's how you check it with a meter. And then this diagram is how you wire it with your, uh, your monitor module. And then a lot of times with like these silent night panels, we're just running a dedicated NAC circuit straight out to the flow bell and we're handling that all in programming. But in other cases where you might just have the, uh, the one water flow device and, uh, and you're working on a system that instead of being able to program the individual NAC circuits, we have an auxiliary power circuit. And so you'll have auxiliary power that you need to use to trip the bell. Well, if you run that power circuit straight to the bell without switching it through the water flow, your bell is just going to ring all the time, whether you reset it, don't reset it, or whatever. So you need to, to switch part of it through the second side of the water flow switch. And you can see that happening with this other circuit. So that box with a circle on it is a, uh, that's your bell. And you can see over here where it says power 24 volt DC or 120 volt AC, that negative line is going straight to your bell and then coming out of your power supply, the positive line comes down, lands on the normally open, and then another line picks up out of the common and finishes the circuit going up to the bell. This being, we want it to be normally open like this so that normal condition, water is not flowing, everything is sitting normal, the bell is not ringing, it's an open switch. And then whenever the water does flow and it's flowed past your time limit, then that switch trips and it connects that circuit from that normally open to the common. Now it closes because it's not normal anymore, and that rings your bell. Um, whenever you start having more than one water flow switch, like uh, one of those pictures I showed you earlier where they have a whole bunch of water flow risers next to each other, trying to wire all of those up in parallel can get confusing really fast. So we typically just throw an addressable relay up on the wall to help simplify it, but you'll wire the addressable relay the same way using the normally open and the common to switch that positive. Um, and uh, that's it. If there's any more questions, be happy to answer them. But that's... Yeah, we can get into the dry system. That's what I wanted to ask. Okay, dry system. Yeah, that's, that's a good thing to talk about too. Um, so a dry system, first I'll talk about the point of it. The point of it's basically anytime there's any where a pipe could freeze like a parking garage or an outdoor pavilion. Um, they don't want to keep water in the pipe in case there is a, an ice storm that comes through that could cause the pipes to burst and, and break and flow water everywhere. And they don't want that. Oh yeah, um, some electrical rooms and stuff will have it. IT rooms, that sort of thing. Uh, so they'll, they actually keep the pipe just dry, full of air, not under water pressure. And uh, that way, whenever the freeze does come through, the pipes don't freeze and break. Um, the way they do that, they actually have, they pressurize air on the other side of that, and they have a valve that sits there and is held in place by the pressurized air, and there's water sitting at the other side of that. That's typically at the, uh, the in the riser room or in a, like a high-rise parking garage. A lot of times they'll have that, a, uh, a sprinkler riser that just on each floor and it'll be in a room that has a heater next to it to keep the, the pipe with the water from bursting. And what happens whenever that sprinkler uh, head goes off, it's, the sprinkler head itself still works the same way with that mercury glass tube. So when that breaks, it releases all the air pressure out of the pipe, and then the water is able to flow into the pipe and still get to the fire. 
Um, but they have to keep that pipe compressed otherwise to keep the water out. And so if uh, something does happen, let's water into the pipe, they have to, uh, they shut off all the valves and everything. They have to drain the pipe of all the water. Then they have to pump it back full of air. And then they can open the pipe back up to let the water be at the valve. So there's an extra, an extra thing we have to monitor on those because we have our tamper valve like we normally do. And then we have a high pressure and a low pressure. The low pressure typically acts as the water flow because if the pressure gets too low, that means water is now flowing into that pipe. Uh, the high pressure is another supervisory that's there because if their air compressor pumped way too much air into that pipe, it's going to take longer for that air to get out of the way to let water in. Um, so, you know, if they're supposed, I don't know what their pressures are actually supposed to be. I'm going to completely make these numbers up. But say their pressure is supposed to be at like 15 PSI, but they're actually got like 85 PSI in there. It's going to take longer for that 85 PSI to exit through that broken sprinkler head, which is then slowing down the water getting to the fire. So that's what that high pressure is for, is to let them know, hey, your pressure is too high. Um, come check it out for service. You need to let some pressure out, figure out what's causing this, so that if an emergency does happen, the water is able to get to the fire in time. Now, how do you determine which one is high and which one is low? Um, I had one sprinkler guy tell me, typically the one that is physically mounted higher is the low pressure, and the one that is physically mounted lower is the high pressure. But I have not always found that to be the case. Uh, what I have found to be the most reliable is just ask the sprinkler guy which is which. Sometimes he'll have a tag hanging on it before I get there. Most of the time I have to call him or track him down and get him to actually come point it out to me. A lot of times, guys, on those on those pressurized systems, and this this may contradict a little bit what Keith is is saying. We may want to do a, a class on this at one time, but a lot of times that switch that's mounted higher up in the in, in the pipe is your is your is for your air pressure, mm -hmm. uh, and then the one the, the one lower below the diaphragm. Sometimes that's actually also called the high pressure switch or the alarm switch. And, and that trips uh, uh, when that releases that air and that water flow. So one of those switches in a, is an alarm condition. The other switch is a high-low switch, which, which tells you if the air pressure is high or low. So you, you've actually got a, a high-pressure alarm switch, which tells you if the water is flowing. And then your pressure switch for air pressure is a high-low switch. One side of that switch is low pressure. And because they want to know low pressure too, because what happens if the if the pressure gets too low, uh, it releases that diaphragm and lets that water energize the uh, sprinkler system, and you've got your sprinkler pipes full of water just because your air pressure went too low. And that's typically what happens more than it getting overpressurized. But both of those both of those are on one switch, and this is where. <laughs> Knowing what you're doing with your meter is very handy. The best way to, to do the final hookup on these is once the the um, once the uh, sprinkler guy says you're good to go, his pressures are right. Then you can read and see which one you know which side has the normally open contact versus the other. Now mm -hmm. the the what, what I told you a minute ago on adjusting water flow switches and let's do it and get her done. Uh, that does not apply to these high-low pressure switches. Don't try to adjust them. They're, they're really finicky. They can be difficult. Do not adjust those. Let's th throw that one back on the on, on the sprinkler guys. Don't don't try to adjust those those switches if you don't know what you're doing and you don't do it a lot. It'll 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 drive you back. And and the reason why I was asking that is because I know I have a job, but and. One of the switches says PS10, and one of them says, <clears throat> excuse me, PS40. So that's why I was kind of asking which one was which. But at the same time, if you take both of those caps off and you look at that switch, on the front side and the back side, it has high and low. So you'll just have to pick normally closed and normally open for the high or the low. So that's why I was asking. Yeah, the, the, the PS40 is a high-low pressure switch. The PS10 uh, 
from the magic of Google, I believe, is the water flow side. Yeah, yeah the PS10. Was, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ramsey. Yeah, what I was saying is, though, but if you take that cap off, they, they have little labels in the inside. The common is going to stay the same. And on either side of it, it has high and low. If you understand what I'm saying. It's all on one switch or two switches? Well, you know, that one has two switches in it. Like right. like the, the tampers and the water flows. On If you look on one side of that, where on the one switch side, it says high and low. And if you reverse it and look on the other side, it says the same thing. Right. One, one, one of the sides of that switch is a um, is 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 a high air, and the other side of the switch is the low air. Correct. But on both switches, it's labeled the same way. So that's why I was asking the the, the PS10. Oh, on the PS, the PS40. Oh, the, you talking about on the PS10 is labeled the same? The same as the PS40. Oh. Uh, so so you guess. have that option on this switch to wire it up as a high or as a low on either one of those. I lost y'all, huh? No, I'm looking that up real quick on Google. <laughs> I'm only seeing one switch on, I'm not doubting you, but I'm, I'm looking at. No, no I'm just saying the switch uh, Ramsey, It's the same as a flow switch. The other side's for possibly for a water flow bell. Okay, yeah, but I was just saying the same switch, it shows, you know, either or. Uh, uh -huh. if, it's a, if it's a high switch or a low switch, it's still going to have the same indications, the, the A, the B, and the common on both sides. You see what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah, well, it's still gonna just trip an alarm, so. But you will have to know which one is high and low. So that that's why I was yeah. asking, yeah, which one I don't one think was. the trip's on high and low. I, you know, we need to look. We're not gonna figure it out right here, right now. If I need to mm -hmm. take a closer look at it, because on those, I mean, it's been a while since I've done one, but typically it's uh, the, on, the, on the PS10 is just a, uh, uh, Monitoring it's just like a water just treat it just like a water flow switch. All right. But once once again, when you're dealing with these these pressure switches on these on on these uh, uh, dry systems, you you almost can't do it without a meter. If you're just trying to hook it up and 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 and, and hope that the, you know you got all the contacts right. Without using your meter, you're spinning your, you know, you very well could be spinning your wheels. That's all I got. Okay, guys, anything else? Okay, well, I appreciate y'all's time. Uh, appreciate you getting to these, you know, the, as best you can. If you, if you can start, we, we're really trying to start these meetings on time. I know we ran over just a little bit. Um, today but uh but i appreciate you showing up to these and uh uh we're gonna keep them up and appreciate all your uh, all your hard work and hopefully in the next day or two we'll figure out who the president is thank you <laughs>